Onus edition of Off the Script backstage. <laughs> Nobody's going to take me seriously with that shit, man. Anyway, backstage creative plans for Randy Orton. What the fuck's going on with Randy Orton? Is he turning heel? Uh, there's rumors going around that he actually may be joining the Wyatt family, leading the Wyatt family. We're going to have full information, full story on that, plus his role in Survivor Series. Huge development in the demotion of Shinsuke Nakamura. What is going to happen? Is he staying in NXT or is he going to be promoted to Raw or SmackDown. Also, I got news on creative plans for both The New Day and Enzo and Cass. What is going on and what does WWE have planned for both of them? Also, the Elimination Chamber is set to return in 2017. How is it going to be used? All this, plus so much more on this episode of Off The Script. Number 141, part number two for your Saturday morning, man. Let's talk some WWE, and I'll see you guys in a little bit. J.D. from New York, 206, it's time for Off the Script, Big Show and Ryback, Strowman and Roman, get off my fucking TV, save me the misery, and all you fucking goons, just grab a cold beer, the man of the hour is finally here, J. What is going on, guys? JD from New York here. Um, this is the number one fucking podcast in your subscription boxes. Right here. On YouTube.com! This is Off The Script. Thank you guys so much for joining me. Saturday, October 29th, 2016. We got a lot to get into. We got a lot of stories. And I'm going to start off with something that really just irked the fuck out of me. And obviously you guys know who it is if... You've been following me on Twitter as of yesterday. Good old Kevin Dunn, you fucking clown. We're going to talk about him. Even though he's not the top story because I would never make a top story about Kevin. Kevin Dunn, fucking disease. Wait till you hear this fucking story. Anyway, boy, off the script is off to a rip-roaring start. On Saturday morning. Anyway, guys, quickly, I do want to make mention. Um, we're going to get right into the news. I do want to make two mentions here, if you don't mind. Number one, uh, I want to thank Grimm's Toy Show for having me out there um, film his latest video, man. If you guys don't know what he's got going on, he's got this clown purge going on. And he reached out to me via DM. You want to come, you're gonna, you, you know, you want to swing by the house, you want to film, dress up as a clown, we'll get you on, uh, on the show. And I'm like, dude, absolutely, you know? So it was a trek to get out there. Even though, you know, I love driving to Jersey. It's the fucking bullshit that you got to deal with leaving New York. It was miserable, dude. Fucking rain, traffic. It took me three hours. And what usually takes me an hour and 15 minutes. Awful. But all of that was quickly rectified. As soon as we got to the house and we began, and we began filming... Uh, he was fucking awesome. He's a class act, genuine fucking dude, and uh, I look to, I look forward to, and hopefully uh, work with him in the future, man. Uh, you know, we throw, we we threw around some ideas and that and whatnot, but uh, I hope to see him again. That was great. I was unveiled as one of the clowns in his clown purge. He ran me over with a car. Uh, I called him a fucking goon and a clown, and I told him that I would bench him in real life, and uh, I escaped. I escaped. 
So hopefully uh, the, the leader of this group can uh, do some damage to Mr. Grimm's Toy Show. But I want to thank uh, Grimm again for uh, having me out there. It was a fucking blast. And uh, like I said, he's just a genuine fucking dude, man. He's doing he's doing big things over there. So congratulations to him. And, uh, and it was fun, man. So I hope you guys enjoyed that. And if you want to go check that out, I will link it right down in the description below. If you guys want to see JD dressed up as a clown, getting hit by a car, bloodied, and calling Grimm a fucking goon, man. What, what more can you ask for? Seriously, what more can you ask for? Also, finally, before we get into the news, guys, uh, I do want to make mention again, I will be with my brother in a couple of weeks. We were supposed to go down to Atlantic City this weekend to hang out with the band and, you know, celebrate uh, one of the former bandmates' birthdays, but we didn't do that, and uh, he got stuck at work. But we are making attempts to head to North uh, Jersey to record the solos for his upcoming EP, and I can't wait for you guys to hear this. If you guys want to find out what's going on with Legionary, if you if you don't know what Legionary is or what they're about or who they are, it's my brother's band. I'm going to leave you a link to his his stuff down in the comments and in the description below. Go check it out. He's got t-shirts for sale as well. I'm going to be getting a t-shirt on Sunday. He's going to be watching Hell in a Cell with me here. And uh, on the following weeks off the script, I'm going to represent it. I'm going to wear it in all three episodes just to give you guys an idea of what they look like. Um, if you guys want to go check out his music, and if you're tempted to buy a t-shirt, man, they're all there on his Bandcamp page. I'm going to leave you a link down in the description. Go check it out. Sample his music. If you guys love the t-shirts, they're professionally made. And when I tell you they're the same quality as my pro wrestling tees, I am not kidding you, man. So go and support my brother. If you guys have been watching my Call of Duty stuff, he's been the band that, you know, lends the talent to the opening theme every single time. So... Uh, him and Condition Critical are my you know, are my one-two combination. So go check that shit out. Let me know what you guys think about that. If you're into thrash, death metal, melodic death metal, technical death metal, you know, if you if you're just into someone who knows what they're they're fucking doing musically, it's my brother. So go check it out. Uh, Legionary link down below in the description. All right. Thank you guys for that. The rest of the plugs I will save for the end of the video. You guys know what those are. Follow me on Twitter at JD from NY206. And if you guys are not subscribed, please do so. And hit that thumbs up if you enjoy off the script. Kevin Dunn! Kevin Dunn. This guy is a complete fucking buffoon. And I said it on Twitter. Kevin Dunn is an absolute fucking disease to WWE. This guy sucks the biggest kinds of fucking cock. I swear to God. If I seen this guy in person, I swear to God, I'd do, I'd do the... The fucking retard, the buck teeth. You know, and I was on my Facebook page, and I seen something that was recommended to me because other people were reporting this story as well. The other various news outlets that I'm following on Facebook. And there was a linked video to Jim Cornette talking about Del Wilkes the Patriot in a complete shoot interview where he said that he would literally pull Kevin Dunn over the fucking table and beat the living shit out of him. And I listened to this and I watched this video on YouTube and I couldn't stop laughing. And Jim Cornette made reference to his buck teeth and he got up from the fucking boardroom where they were throwing around creative ideas. He got up, he told Kevin Dunn to go fuck himself. He got up, he went back to his hotel room. A few days later, Vince McMahon calls up Cornette, says you got to apologize to Kevin Dunn. You know, Kevin Dunn, you know, did uh, did great. He saved the fucking, uh, the tape library from fucking burning up in flames or whatever the fuck Vince McMahon was talking about. Apparently, Kevin Dunn has a job for life because he saved the, the tape library. So he's like, you got you to gotta apologize for Kevin Dunn. You know, we're all here working together cohesively as a unit. So they invite, or Vince McMahon invites Kevin Dunn and Jim Cornette to his home, and they are sitting in the same room on separate sides of the room. And Vince McMahon leaves. He just leaves those two there by themselves. Kevin Dunn, as explained, uh, as explained by Jim Cornette, cries in front of Cornette because Cornette made fun of Kevin Dunn's buck teeth. This is, I swear to God, this is a true fucking story. When you guys listen to the iTunes podcast, I'm going to play you the actual sound clip from this six-minute interview that, that Jim Cornette conducted. I don't want to get fucking copyrighted strike here, so that's just the short version. If you guys want to listen to Off the Script on iTunes, I'm going to play the fucking full thing on there. I'm going to pull it right from YouTube, and I'm going to upload it to the iTunes audio podcast, man. You got to listen to what Jim Cornette says about Kevin Dunn, man. This guy is a complete fucking goon. But he was in the news yesterday... 
He was in the news yesterday, man. Kevin Dunn apparently does not like Becky Lynch. He does not like Becky Lynch for whatever reason, man. I don't know. I, I think she's quite attractive, man. I love the orange hair. I think she's a very attractive woman. She's got a great body, right? Her voice might, you know, her voice might sound a little, you know, you know, but it is what it is, man. It's it's just the accent, you know. But there's other WWE performers that have an accent as well, you know, just as bad as Becky Lynch. So why is he picking on Becky Lynch? Becky Lynch solidified herself as the premier women's superstar on SmackDown by becoming the brand's first women's champion at the Blue Brand's first exclusive pay-per-view of the new era, Backlash. The match, of course, featured five other competitors in a six-pack challenge, which was great, by the way, one of the best matches of that night, that the WWE could easily awarded to a more established veteran like Nikki Bella or Natalia, allowing the younger, younger women to chase. But the decision was made to go with Becky Lynch, as it continued to remain clear that she was and is one of the top female performers in the entire company. Her first title defense was originally scheduled to come against Alexa Bliss at the No Mercy pay-per-view two weeks ago, but a medical procedure forced the company to scrap the match. Now, people are running rampant with the fucking rumors that Becky Lynch um, had an abortion. That's why she uh, she was out for a couple, uh, you know, a week or two. None of this is true. I think that's just people spewing their mouths. The main rumor that is going around and that is being speculated is that Be is that Becky Lynch had her appendix removed. So that's what is going on, though. That has not been officially confirmed to what Becky's ailment was. But it was enough of an issue that WWE kept her out of the ring for a significant amount of time, a couple of weeks, as they are now advertising Lynch to defend her title against Alexa on the November 8th episode of SmackDown, which airs in Glasgow, Scotland. On the surface, aside from the recent minor setback, things appear to be going well for the Irish last kicker, Becky Lynch. But according to a report from several sources on Friday, there is a top WWE goon, goon, I'm not using the word official, because that's not what he is, he's a fucking clown, who isn't high on Becky as everyone else is. Kevin Dunn, WWE's executive vice president of television production, has been a fixture with the company for more than two decades and is widely considered Vince McMahon's right-hand man. <laughs> you guys listening to me on Sunday, man, with the fucking iTunes podcast. Just picture me stroking a cock. Now, I don't do I don't do such things, but that's what Kevin Dunn does, man. He strokes Vince McMahon's cock. Dunn was named to WWE's board of directors in 2008 and has line produced every live WWE telecast for the last 28 years. Safe to say Dunn, along with Vince and a few others, have seen and heard all there is to see and hear in professional wrestling and sports entertainment. Apparently, Dunn has heard enough of Becky Lynch, as far as promos go, anyway. There's no denying Becky's in-ring abilities, but Dunn has grown annoyed of her accent and is push pushing for her mic time to be cut down significantly or cut out altogether. This will be interesting to follow as you, can, uh, as you can't quite have the face and champion of the women's division remain silent. The brand split represented an opportunity to Becky to lead the charge for women's wrestling on Tuesday nights. She has a tremendous amount of backstage support. Many who believe she has the potential to be great at delivering promos. But Kevin Dunn has a tremendous amount of stroke. There's that word again. Stroke. Right hand, man. They go hand in hand, period. Kevin Dunn has tremendous stroke behind the scenes. And his opinion matters more than most in final decisions. Why? Why does this guy's opinion matter? I would love to know that. You know? This guy, I, I've read stories and I've heard stories that Triple H hates this man. And he doesn't like Triple H. He's not all that fond of Triple H. And he's afraid that when Triple H eventually takes over the WWE, 
when Vince McMahon is no longer capable of running the company, that Kevin Dunn will be the first to go. And if I had to make a decision, I will back Triple H, Paul Levesque. I will back him 1,000% on this decision. This guy and his opinion do not matter, period. Do you want to know why I have an opinion such as that? Because I know from the things that I hear and the things that I read that Kevin Dunn is not passionate about WWE. Kevin Dunn is not passionate about professional wrestling. Kevin Dunn has been with this company for 28 years because he knows he has the ear of Vince McMahon. And apparently Vince McMahon owes this man something to keep him around for 28 years. I don't know. I don't know why someone would keep someone who hates the fucking business around for 28 years. This man has no passion for the business. He doesn't give a fuck about the talent. He doesn't know what type of talent he possesses. He doesn't see the greatness in the talent and the roster that they have now. This guy could give two fucks about NXT. Everybody from NXT that's come up has been a complete fucking waste, or at least most of them, because of Kevin Dunn. Why? Because Triple H is in charge of NXT. And Kevin Dunn doesn't like Triple H. And if Kevin Dunn is on the main roster and one of Triple H's babies gets promoted to the main roster, whose hands do you think they fall into now? Kevin Dunn. And whose ear does Kevin Dunn have? Vince McMahon. What do you think Vince McMahon's going to do when Kevin Dunn says something? You think he's going to say, fuck you, Kevin Dunn, I'm doing what I want? No, he's going to take this man's opinion as the holy grail. Oh my God, Mr. Dunn, what do you think? You, you mean you're leaving day-to-day -day operations and procedures and, and you know, spur-of-the-moment decisions in the hands of Kevin Dunn? You're leaving the, the roster and certain aspects of the roster and talent in the hands of Kevin Dunn? Why? This guy doesn't give a fuck about the WWE. All he cares about is the money that you're lining his pockets with. This man made more money last year than Vince McMahon himself. And McMahon is the fucking CEO. Who the fuck is Kevin Dunn? This is absolutely mind-boggling to me. Absolutely mind-boggling to me. Kevin Dunn. He doesn't like Becky Lynch's accent. Okay, so what about Sheamus? What about Sheamus? What about Rusev? What about Del Rio? Right? Del Rio's not there anymore, but... What about Neville? What about Neville? Is that the reason why Neville is fucking the man that creative forgot? Because Kevin Dunn doesn't like his accent? Or what? That he's a vanilla midget? Or what? That he was overly successful in NXT? And now that he's on the main roster? Oh, I'll show Triple H. I'll show... I'll show Triple H. Who, oh, boy? That's all it is. It's like a fucking game to them. It's like, how can one outdo the other? And then you know who pays? The talent pays. The talent suffers. Because Kevin Dunn doesn't like you. Right? This whole deal. Remember when Kevin Dunn was when, when Kevin Dunn was calling Kevin Owens fat? Oh, Kevin Owens is fat. And they were making fat jokes about Kevin Owens. What is he thinking now that Kevin Owens is the universal champion? Huh? I don't know. I'd love to be a fly on that fucking wall. Seriously, this guy is a fucking disease to WWE, and the company will be so much better off, it's like, you know, it's like Resident Evil, and the fucking, uh, and the fucking virus that's plaguing, uh, you know, the entire fucking town, right, and you have the antidote right there, you have the antidote right there, Kevin Dunn is the fucking disease in Raccoon City, and then Chris Redfield is the one who has the fucking power to remove him. Chris Redfield being Triple H. Remove the disease. Remove the fucking disease. You have Umbrella Corporation right in your own fucking company. Remove it. It's awful. Absolutely awful. This man is a fucking plague to World Wrestling Entertainment. I would not be shocked if he is the one ruining what we loved about Monday Night Raw. Seriously. You know, how much pull does Kevin Dunn really have? It, you know, how is Monday Night Raw able to go on? He's producing these shows, right? He's producing these shows. He's probably having a great life, a chuckle on the back as we are all complaining about Monday Night Raw. He don't fucking care. He don't care. You know how much money this guy is making? 
at the expense of this company while we fucking bitch and moan every fucking week while this show is absolutely fucking dreadful. He don't care. He's making more money every single year because he's right in Vince McMahon's fucking pocket. He's the one fucking reaching behind Vince McMahon to stroke that golden cock. That's all he is. This guy is a fucking plague, and I can't wait for him to go. I don't know when that's going to be, but that will be the fucking grandest day we as WWE fans can actually have happen. It's not clear whether the accent hindered her before. Nobody ever said anything about her accent in NXT. Nobody. Now it's a, now it's a fucking issue, right? But it was noted prior to the brand extension. And uh, Grimm is actually DMing me. Uh, I can't read it. Grimm is actually DMing me about the video, so uh, sorry for that. Uh, it was noted that prior to the brand extension, WWE officials were currying favors towards Charlotte and Sasha Banks ahead of Becky Lynch already. No shit. The move to Tuesdays gave her the opportunity to escape their shadows, but it remains to be seen whether she'll stay on top despite the criticism from Kevin Dunn. We certainly witnessed an example of Dunn's exercising his power as a recent... Uh, as recent this past week's tapings for SmackDown, where Becky had been out of action and she was supposed to come back and explain to everybody she barely got any fucking mic time, right? She barely got any fucking mic time. She was scheduled to conduct an interview with Renee Young in the ring before, before she even uttered a fucking sentence. They cut her off and Alexa Bliss came down to interfere. Many top WWE officials apparently, including Dunn, have warmed up to Alexa's skill set I wonder what skill set they're talking about. The ones in the ring or the ones that she does, uh, you know, in other places. I don't know. Including her work on the mic. Which mic are you talking about, Kevin Dunn? The one that you actually hold in the ring while speaking to the WWE Universe? Or, uh, or do you want Alexa Bliss to hold your mic? God forbid. You know? I don't think she'd go that low. Seriously. I don't, I don't know anybody who would go that low. Can you imagine Kevin Dunn getting a fucking blowjob? Or a hand job. <laughs> oh, Becky. Oh, TV. Yeah, bitch. <laughs> Can you imagine? Seriously. Absolutely fucking disgusting. She certainly conveyed a more confident persona in recent weeks. And it appears her aggression and promos may have to carry the remainder of the feud until a decision and direction is decided on. For Becky, give me a fucking break. Give me a break. You know, instead, you know, this is the thing I don't get with Kevin Dunn. You know, he's so critical about people's fucking, you know, the lack of something in someone, right? Instead of being a producer, what is, what are you supposed to do as a producer? You know, I don't work in film, I don't work in television, but if you're a producer, you're supposed to guide and teach and let them know what you want done the way you want it. Correct? If Kevin Dunn cared about this company, the product, the shows, and the talent, he would sit down with them and tell them what they have to do. You know, work on her mic skills. Work on her delivery. Do you think Kevin Dunn is front and center in doing any of that? Of course not. He don't give a fuck. He'll be just the one to say, I want her off TV. I want her off TV. That's the, he'll be the one to say that with the fucking pocket protector and the, the fucking headset. And he's giving out orders in uh, in Gorilla Pit or in the truck, where, wherever the fuck this goon resides when a live television taping happens. But you're going to derail Becky because of her accent? Give me a fucking break. Seriously. Give me a break. How many people? I'm going to leave it up to you guys because I want to get on with the next story. Eno uh, the next story. Enough talking about this fucking. How many of the biggest stars in the company had accents? Seriously. Sound off in the comments below because this guy is a fucking buffoon. Kevin Dunn. I hate this guy. Seriously. What a fucking clown. What a clown. Anyway, moving on. Let's talk about uh, Shinsuke Nakamura here. We have uh, developments on Nakamura. Uh, will he be demoted to Raw or SmackDown? Let's find out. At first, fans accepted the idea of Nakamura going to NXT initially, understanding the WWE's desire to acclimate him to the American style of pro wrestling. But as the months have gone by, going on eight as of right now, it's becoming increasingly puzzling while the King of Strong Style has not been promoted yet. We all know Nakamura could be on either brand right now, uh, but there is a time and a place for that to happen. Obviously, the main thing here is they pulled Balor, 
He got hurt. He's not there, but they did pull Balor. He was going to be the face of Monday Night Raw. They gave him the, the Universal Championship. Nakamura was going to be the man to take that spot. And my my logic here is they don't have anybody in place to do that right now. You know, they don't have anybody in place to be that next big face, that level of a Balor or a Nakamura. Nakamura will be in NXT, and Nakamura should be in NXT until they find someone as big as he is, or at least close, that can replace him. Simple. I don't want to hear any arguments. I don't want to hear any arguments from anybody, but, oh, but J.D., he should be on Monday Night Raw. Do you really want this guy on Monday Night Raw? I mean, serious. A- answer that question. Look yourself in the mirror and a- ask yourself that question and answer it while looking at yourself. Do I really want Shinsuke Nakamura on Monday Night Raw? Fuck no. He needs to remain in NXT, not only for the brand, but for himself, too. God only knows what they do with him. This guy would probably be jobbing a fucking Bo Dallas on Monday Night Raw. And then, I think we'd all take fucking torches and pitchforks to Titan Tower. But, nobody knows what's going on. Now I have uh, a credible source. You know, Daily Wrestling News, the Wrestling Observer Newsletter, they are now reporting on Nakamura and what will happen with him. It appears that WWE officials have pinpointed Nakamura as the flagship superstar for NXT, and no plans of bringing him up to the main roster right now at all. The line of thinking follows their recent decisions to delay the promotions of Finn Balor and Bayley, despite the obvious notion that they were more than ready to go to either Raw or SmackDown. Balor was the cream of the crop in NXT for his entire year and a half run, watching the likes of Baron Corbin, Tyler Breeze, Apollo Crews, Kevin Owens, Sami Zayn, Dana Brooke, The Ascension, The Vaude Villains, Charlotte. And I hate that they're calling her Charlotte Flair. So fucking stupid. Charlotte, Sasha Banks, and Becky Lynch all get called up before him. Now, out of that list, um, I don't mind that Baron Corbin's on SmackDown. Tyler Breeze, I don't mind. I wish they'd utilize these guys better. Apollo Crews, I don't mind that he's on SmackDown, but I would prefer him in NXT. I really think he needed to develop some more than NXT. Kevin Owens, on the main roster for sure. Sami Zayn, he do- he belonged on the main roster. Dana Brooke, she don't even belong in NXT. She don't even belong in the WWE. Never mind fucking NXT, Raw, SmackDown, Ring of... She don't belong anywhere. At all. She belongs on a fucking porno set. Wearing that fucking nurse outfit that she was seen wearing with Gallows and Anderson. That got Gallows' wife pissed off. That's where she belongs. Starring alongside Eva Marie, of course. The Ascension. I love The Ascension. They need to do something with them. The Vaude Villains. Where the fuck are they? I don't know. I mean, they're a quality fucking tag team. Why are these teams not being utilized? Charlotte. Sasha Banks. Becky. You guys get the point. Triple H claimed there was a method to his madness then. Maintaining it now. He doesn't want his top stars getting called up and being forced with facing a depleted NXT roster that he's built into a legitimate touring brand. It needs star power just like WWE. Balor was the flag bearer then, and Nakamura has since assumed the same role now. Bayley dealt with similar issues as the face of the women's division. On the bright side, this could mean that Samoa Joe could be getting the call to the main roster soon, hopefully to SmackDown. His title reign came at the expense of Balor, opening the door for Finn to get promoted. Now that Nakamura is champion, it enables the company to do the same with Joe. However, many have claimed that both are long overdue and point to Bobby Roode, Hideo Itami, and Austin Aries as worthy successors to their spots in NXT. Out of the list right now, the only one who is capable of taking that role from Nakamura is Bobby Roode. That's it. Ty Dillinger has has an opportunity to build his name and, you know, build his stock as well. But Hideo Itami is always hurt. Who knows where this guy could have been if he wasn't fucking hurt. Austin Aries, he got fucked up by Nakamura. Apparently Nakamura fucking roughed him up in a, in a recent house show at NXT. I don't know where it was, but he bruised his fucking foot. He legit looked like he had no eye. His, his left eye was completely... It was like it wasn't there. Have you guys seen the recent photos? He got fucked up. I don't know what the fuck Nakamura did to him, but... Something went wrong. Unless it, I, I, when I first seen it, I thought it was like a fucking, uh, like a Halloween gag. You gotta see pictures of this guy, man. I thought he was dressing up like a fucking zombie. I didn't know Nakamura did damage like that in the ring. Jesus fucking, I know he was King of Strong Style, but holy shit, I thought it was like a fucking Halloween costume. So Austin Aries, great fucking talent. Only one on that list, Bobby Roode, to take Nakamura's spot. Speaking of Aries, like I just mentioned, completely unrelated news. 
Nakamura caught the greatest man that ever lived with a kick to the face Wednesday night at an NXT live event. The match was stopped, and Aries needed medical assistance immediately. Some speculated a broken jaw, but at the very least, he's sporting a massive black eye. It's been rumored that Samoa Joe's first program in WWE will be against Braun Strowman. Preliminary creative plans have called for Joe to be the first superstar to defeat Strowman, and if received well, could be the gateway to a potential feud with Brock Lesnar. Wow, WWE, you're learning. Because I've been saying that for fucking months. This is all assuming Nakamura, success, Nakamura successfully defends the championship against Joe at TakeOver Toronto. As for Nakamura, main stage rematches with AJ Styles, Kevin Owens, Brock Lesnar will seemingly have to be put on the back burner for now. Um, and the foreseeable future, he will carry the torch for the NXT brand until Triple H deems him ready and deems another capable of bearing that main attraction burden. So, Triple H has got it right, man. Until you find someone for Nakamura, he stays. Because you do not want to deplete your roster and you need a major star, especially if you're touring, that people want to come out and see. Nakamura is that man. I know age is an issue, but he will be down there for at least another year. I don't see anybody being built up in that time. Bobby Roode is the closest. I just don't know how much faith and trust WWE has in Bobby Roode to lead as a number one man. I don't know. I mean, he's got it all. Certainly has it. He's got the entrance, and he's got the fucking, the promo, and he's got the theme song. All of that rolled into one. You got more than enough with Bobby Roode. Will the fans buy him as a number one guy? I don't know. Right now, he's off to a white hot start. I love Bobby Roode. I love everything about him. I can't wait to fucking see him. He's probably my favorite part of NXT, period. But we'll see what happens. Triple H got the right idea with Nakamura, though. He needs someone on about the same level as Nakamura to replace him if he needs to be demoted to either Raw or SmackDown. News, I have news on, where the fuck is it? I know I have it here. I know I have it here, man. Well, I wanted to talk about something with Samoa Joe. Did I not label it? Oh, yeah, here we go. Here we go. Ex-WWE executive reveals why Vince McMahon was never interested in signing Samoa Joe. Listen to this story. Despite being universally recognized as one of the most talented wrestlers in the world, if not all of WWE, it took WWE 16 years to sign former TNA champion Samoa Joe. Former WWE executive Bruce Pritchard, who worked closely with WWE chairman Vince McMahon for two decades, explained why Vince McMahon was never interested in signing Samoa Joe until recently on the latest episode of Something 2 Wrestling Podcast. And I quote, this is from Bruce Pritchard, I'll tell you why he wasn't considered. It was because they thought he was a fat Samoan. He looked out of shape. He wasn't the body type that Vince liked, and they felt that it wouldn't work. End quote. He was a fat Samoan. Now, I know a lot of you guys watched TNA, or at least I think some of you watched TNA in its heyday. You know, the Joes versus the, the Angles and the Joes versus the Styles, right? Those types of things. And, I don't know, I didn't consider Joe fat then. You know, some may say Joe was better then than he is now. Obviously, he's playing a different character right now. He's a little bit more slow and methodical. He's not as athletic as he was back then. Obviously, he's a little bit older now. He's a little bit more mature. But he's playing the role that he's given. He's a fucking badass, I'm gonna fucking break your fucking jaw type of heel. You know, there's no reason for Samoa Joe to be fucking diving and flying and fucking being acrobatic. It was a different time. But I didn't think Joe was fat. I mean, even if he was, who the fuck cares? The guy was fucking talented. You want the best talent for your roster. You're not going to sign someone because he's fat? I don't get that logic. And this is why executives, I swear to God, you know, Vince may love wrestling. Vince may be a fucking certified genius at times, more so back then than he is now. I think this guy's fucking... Absolutely clueless right now. But I honestly think Vince McMahon has surrounded himself, like CM Punk said, with glorified fucking yes-men. They don't have any fucking clue about what this business wants, what this business needs, you know? They don't have any clue about true talent. They don't They don't have an iota of fucking anything about true talent or what WWE needs. I mean, look at the fucking ratings. Where's, the, where's your audience? Look at, look at Monday Night Raw. If that's what you think the audience wants, obviously Vince McMahon has people working for him that don't give a fuck. 
or at least don't know anything about WWE. It's got to be. It's got to be. Samoa Joe, because he wasn't signed to WWE, after Steve Austin has been proclaiming for years that WWE needs to look at Samoa Joe. It took them, what, a, a year and a half ago to fucking bring this guy in? And now look, you know? What, what, happened when, what happens when Samoa Joe reaches Monday Night Raw? He's going to walk across Vince McMahon and he's going to think back to why they didn't sign him. Oh, you, you, you know, you thought I was fat, right? And what happens when Samoa Joe reaches Monday Night Raw and he shows up everybody on the main roster about how to play a legit fucking badass heel? You know, this man is doing some of the best work that I've seen in years in WWE. There's nobody more believable right now. Maybe for Nakamura, you know, but you got Samoa Joe making you believe that, yes, heels do still exist in WWE. I mean, the guy's fucking phenomenal at everything he's done. One of the best reasons NXT is putting on some of the best television. You know, their best segments include Samoa Joe. You know, they've taken a hit lately. They've kind of floundered, but... What did you expect when they pull Valor and Bailey and American Alpha and they're pulling all these guys, Apollo Crews, Baron Corbin? What do you expect? What do you expect for NXT to do when they pull all this talent? You know? There's no way around it. But that's what Bruce, Bruce Pritchard said. They, they didn't sign Samoa Joe because he was fat. Vince has signed Samoan wrestlers with the same exact body type during Joe's run in TNA. So it must have been something else. With the most notable one being Edward Fatu. Umaga. So what's the difference between Samoa Joe and Umaga at the time? I don't know. You know? I, I just don't get it. When Pritchard was asked why Vince McMahon was willing to sign Umaga and not Joe, he responded by saying that the WWE chairman viewed the Samoan Bulldozer as one of the family because he was part of the Anoy wrestling dynasty, which had ties with several, with several WWE uh you know, or had ties with WWE for several decades. Up until recently, WWE wasn't interested in bringing in indie darlings like Samoa Joe, but if they changed their mind when they decided to make NXT a legitimate alternative brand, if NXT was never created, then we may, nay, then we may never see Joe, along with several other non-WWE stars, be brought into the company. Joe, who is now 37, has been a huge part of WWE's developmental brand, NXT, for over a year now, and it's beginning to look like he's finally heading to the main roster at some point in the near future. It's unclear whether Joe will land or where Joe will land once he's brought to the main roster. There's been a rumor going around that, you know, he's going to Raw to face Braun Strowman, also the dream matchup of Lesnar versus Joe, which we've talked about, something that WWE will probably do in the future. So while we don't know for sure, it does look like the former NXT champion will end up wrestling on Monday night. As of this writing, Joe is scheduled to wrestle Shinsuke Nakamura at TakeOver Toronto on November 19th. Can't wait for it. If he loses the match, that could be a sign that he'll be heading to the main roster before the end of the year. Joe and Nakamura's NXT Championship match will probably be the main event of that NXT show, but it wasn't originally scheduled to be. Toronto native WWE Hall of Famer Trish Stratus was scheduled to return and challenge Asuka for the Women's Championship, but plans were changed, obviously, after she announced her pregnancy, and Mickie James will be taking her place at the event. So there you have it right there. Joe and Nakamura now will be headlining TakeOver Toronto. The card right now uh, exists as this. Nakamura versus Joe for the NXT Championship. Asuka versus Mickey James for the NXT Women's Championship. Bobby Roode versus Ty Dillinger. The Dusty Rhodes Tag Team Classic Finals. We may see the Revival versus uh, Tommaso Ciampa and Johnny Gargano. I don't know. So there's a chance Joe's main roster debut could be held off until the Royal Rumble as a surprise entrant. WWE could shock everyone and have Samoa Joe regain the NXT Championship at the Toronto show if they want to which would obviously mean that he'll be staying down at NXT uh, for a bit longer. But even if that does end up happening, we'll probably still see him on the main roster before WrestleMania 33. So that is the latest on Joe. So fucking petty that they would not sign Samoa Joe because he was a fat Samoan. Meanwhile, they signed Umaga because he was part of the Anoy family dynasty. Man, such fucking political garbage in WWE. I mean... I'm glad after the fact, years down the line, that this shit is exposed because it just shows you how fucking stupid and the mindset, the, the mind, the mindset of these of these guys, man, the McMahons and all these fucking political goons, these corporate goons in WWE. It's awful, absolutely fucking awful, man. None of them give a fuck about the company or the business. They are completely in it for themselves because it's all about the money, man. It's all about the fucking money. And finally, guys, I'm gonna save the elimination chamber talk for. 
um, later on. We are going to talk about Randy Orton and this big news regarding his Survivor Series role and backstage plans for Randy Orton. Uh, surprising news regarding his Survivor Series role as well. As seen on the most recent episode of SmackDown Live, Randy Orton turned on Kane, turned on Kane by hitting the Big Red Monster with an RKO during his final match with the Eater of Worlds. Then in a promo backstage, Orton told Andrea DeMarco that if you can't beat them, join them. Obviously hinting at the idea of joining the Wyatt family instead of continuing to battle against them. While Randy gave the impression that he'd be aligning himself with the faction, which only features Wyatt and Luke Harper at present, Cage Side Cease is now reporting that the Viper will be distancing himself from the group, but it's entirely possible that he will remain a heel after turning on Kane. The other theory floating around, however, is that Orton hit the RKO on Kane in what would be another mind game against Bright. And if that's the case, who cares? Who cares? This feud should have been done already. Over. Nobody gives a fuck about it. Unless you want to do a buried alive match or a casket match, blow it off. Give give the fans something, you know? I think that kind of stipulation or gimmick would go over very well in this feud, especially in 2016 when we, you know, the last time we haven't seen a buried alive match is God knows when, you know? If you do recall, Daniel Bryan joined the Wyatt family for a couple of weeks, but he was hypnotized. He was like mesmerized, you know? He was all there, but he was being... I don't know, he was being mesmerized or hypnotized by, by Bray Wyatt. So, they could do something like that. That happened back in 2013. Only to turn back on Bray and set up the match between the two at the Royal Rumble. Do you guys remember that steel cage match where Daniel Bryan came out of it and snapped out of him? And I haven't heard, yes chance, I haven't heard a crowd like that in ever. Daniel Bryan, if you want to go fucking, if you, gotta, if you want to go research that on YouTube, man. Just type in Daniel Bryan, Bray Wyatt, Monday Night Raw, Steel Cage. You'll eventually find it. He had the crowd. It's like he had them fucking dangling for the carrot, Daniel Bryan. I, I never seen someone more over. I swear to God, I say it all the time. I never seen someone more over since Stone Cold and The Rock. Daniel Bryan. God, does WWE miss him. I think all of us collectively miss him, man. Who knows what would, what would be going on with Daniel Bryan now with with the current state of WWE right now being fucking as terrible as it is. But he was something special, man. I tell you that. And the two match and the two that they had, uh, Wyatt and Daniel Bryan, the match that they had at the Royal Rumble 2014, absolutely fucking unbelievable match, man. Unbelievable. Probably the best match in the whole fucking pay-per-view. There's a chance that Orton could be pulling something similar, leading to the culmination of a match between the two at SmackDown's final brand exclusive pay-per-view, TLC. Of course, this would delay or completely scrap any plans for Orton to square off with Styles for the title as planned, as rumored. As noted, a conclusion between Randy Orton and Bray Wyatt wouldn't come until December. The other factor in that decision is because, according to Wrestling Inc., Randy Orton is not scheduled to be at the Survivor Series. He's not, he's not scheduled to be there on November 20th. Orton's wife is actually pregnant with a baby girl and is expected to give birth two days after the pay-per-view. Orton is not advertised for Survivor Series or the SmackDown tapings the week before. Chances are, Orton and Wyatt may have not been booked in a singles match at Survivor Series anyway, as noted, uh, well, I, I at least expected both of them to be on the same fucking team. Now, who are you going to get to be on the team SmackDown to go against Raw's five? I don't know. I figured it was going to be Styles, Cena, Ambrose, Orton, and Wyatt. I mean, that's a good five to me. I mean, there's obviously conflict between all five of those guys in some which way, but those are your best five. But what are you going to do? Styles? Obviously, you got to have your WWE champion. By default, you're, you're going to pick your five best. Obviously, your champions are going to fucking be the team captains. Obviously. Obviously, WWE. You know? God only knows, Kevin Owens is the universal champion. He should be the captain. They'll probably make Roman Reigns the fucking captain, for all we know. Um... So, if that's the case, who's it going to be? Styles? Miz? Ziggler? I'm hearing Cena's not even going to be there. You know? I, I don't know. I don't know what's going on. Ambrose? Who are you going to have? Cena's got to be there. Cena has to be there. I don't see Cena sitting out Survivor Series. I, I just don't. He's got to be there. Anyway. Orton's wife pregnant. He's not going to be at Survivor Series. Chances are Orton and Wyatt may not have been booked in a singles match anyway. SmackDown and Raw are in the midst of forming three, three traditional Survivor Series teams. 
one of which will pit five of the brand's top superstars against each other. Randy certainly would have qualified for that match, along with Wyatt, perhaps. Styles Ambrose Cena, like I just mentioned. It is yet to be determined whether the heavyweight championships from both shows will be defended. I mean, the ha no. Survivor Series does not need a championship match. Especially if you're five best. I mean, your champions are your number one for your brands. They have to be on your team that includes your five best. Brock Lesnar, Goldberg will be the main event most likely. If Styles is booked to put the championship on the line, it will come against Ambrose, taking those two and Orton out of the mix, severely diminishing the talent level from, from SmackDown's, you know, A team. But the interesting thing to keep an eye on is whether they keep Randy Orton heel or not, as a full turn likely precludes um, the WWE from pairing him up with AJ Styles in what continues to be a much-anticipated feud. I'm hearing Styles and Orton for the Royal Rumble. You know, if they want to blow off this Randy Orton, Bray Wyatt thing, they have time to do it, especially if they're building towards Orton and Styles for Royal Rumble. You know, Shawn Michaels is a huge long shot. I would like to see Shawn Michaels. I doubt we do. Orton is going to be the backup plan. I think that's what they're building towards, towards the Alamo Dome and the Royal Rumble. But it's going to be interesting to see what WWE does with the SmackDown, uh, the SmackDown Survivor Series team. And they, they have to have your best five. And right now, if Orton's going to be out, and, you know, John Cena is up in the air. Nobody knows what the fuck he's doing. Uh, what's going to happen? You know? Is WWE going to put the WWE Championship on the line and the Universal Championship on the line? I'm hearing Survivor Series is now four hours. Why? Why is Survivor Series four fucking hours, man? All because it's part of the Big Five or the Big Four doesn't need to be four hours long. Didn't they learn from SummerSlam? How many people enjoyed SummerSlam? Seriously. Nobody. SummerSlam was one of the worst fucking pay-per-views of the year, along with WrestleMania. Go figure, their two biggest fucking pay-per-views being the two worst of the year. And people were fucking tired. It was too long. Too long. You got an hour pre-show and four hours of fucking pay-per-view. Five hours. Seriously? Survivor Series needs to be three hours. Do yourself a favor and manage your time a little bit better. You don't need four hours for a fucking Survivor Series pay-per-view when all the other ones were three. Book correctly and it'll work. Four hours is overkill, but overkill apparently doesn't, doesn't, you know, lend itself to WWE's vocabulary. They don't know the term or the meaning of overkill. Give me a break. Like three, three Hell in a Cell matches is fucking, you know, necessary on Sunday night. Four hours was necessary for WrestleMania. Or five hours for WrestleMania. Four hours was necessary for SummerSlam. Come on, bro. Seriously. WWE, again. The whole theme of this entire part, of this entire fucking news article that I read in the last 40 minutes, they're clueless. WWE is absolutely fucking clueless. Awful. What I think is going to happen with Randy Orton... I don't think he's turning heel. This is nothing but a mind game. This is the Viper. You know? Well, what does this theme song say? I hear voices in my head. The guy's fucking going crazy. You know? You think he's joining the Wyatt family? No, he's not. This is nothing but a mind game. He's going to try and get in with the Wyatts, and then before you know it, he's going to attack. Just like a Viper does. He's going to slither his way in there, and he's going to fucking RKO him before he even blinks. That's exactly what's going to happen. And then the AJ Styles, Randy Orton rumors, I could certainly see becoming a reality at the Royal Rumble. Because how many people want to, how, how I mean, how many people want to bet on the fact that Shawn Michaels is going to come out of retirement? You know, it's not going to happen, you know? I would love to see it happen, but you got to show me something first, you know? I'll believe it when I see it. So that's the latest on Randy Orton, backstage creative plans, and news regarding his Survivor Series role. That's all I got for Randy Orton, man. He's not joining the Wyatts, and he is not turning heel. AJ Styles is the heel. AJ is going to be the heel going into that match if it does happen. Randy Orton is going to be the in-betweener, you know? Even AJ Styles right now, people people cheer him. People respect him. And people cheer him because they appreciate good talent. You know, he, play, he plays a cocky, dick-like heel, but people also are going to cheer him because they have that much level of respect for him. So, it's going to be a toss-up between the two. Randy Orton's not turning heel, and he's not joining the Wyatt family. Fact. Just want to let you guys know about that, okay? So, that is off the script, guys. That is everything for part two. If you guys did enjoy the video, please let me know down in the comments below 
what you make of everything that we discussed here. And I'll see you guys in part three, man. We got news. I'm going to have news hopefully all day long regarding Hell in a Cell. Uh, I got a big story regarding Hell in a Cell news. I'm going to make that a separate video. Why Vince McMahon does not want the women to main event Hell in a Cell. So if you're, if you're CEO, if your CEO does not want to give the women the spotlight in this revolution, is it really necessary to call it a revolution? I mean, Vince McMahon is telling you by that fact alone, I don't want the women main eventing a pay-per-view. So go fuck your revolution. Obviously, they're not making history. Vince McMahon doesn't give a fuck about history. He has his stance on the women and it's going to stick. That's what that tells me. So, there's no history being made, folks. We're going to talk about that. I'll have news on that. Uh, we'll talk about the Elimination Chamber. We'll talk about plans for uh, Enzo and Cass and the New Day. I also got news on Vince McMahon going nuts back st backstage after fans didn't react well to Brock Lesnar's segment on Monday Night Raw. I mean, what, what the fuck did he expect? The show was awful, and he tried to get Brock Lesnar booed in his hometown. I mean, if that doesn't tell you that this man needs to be removed from... Everything creative, I have no... I don't, I don't know what to tell you. I just don't know what to tell you. So we'll talk about that. Hopefully more news breaks. It's been a very slow news week, man. Obviously, WWE fucking sucks cock right now. And there's no news. So when there's no news, off the script is going to have to improvise along the way. So hopefully I'm doing a swell job for you guys. But if you guys want to check out everything else that I did previously this week, man, all my videos are linked down below. Patreon.com if you guys want to... Support the podcast, and you guys want to pledge monthly, patreon.com slash JD from NY206. I want to thank Travis again and everybody else that pledged this week. You guys are fucking beasts. If you guys want to get on that, get in on that, go read the mission statement on there, man. You'll find out why I'm here, what I'm doing, where I want to go, and what I want to accomplish. You know, the things that I had to go through to pretty much push myself to do this. It's all on the mission statement, man. Read that. Very heartfelt. If you guys feel like you want to pledge, it's always there for you. And you guys get early access. This particular video will be early access to everybody that's a Patreon. Whether it's a cent, a dollar, five dollars. It's always early access for everybody that's on my Patreon pledge. So thank you guys so much. That's patreon.com slash JD from NY206. If you guys don't want to do that, man, Pro Wrestling Tees, Barbershop Window, One Hour Tees. We are affiliated with Barbershop Window. We are a partner with Barbershop Window. Go buy the merchandise, man. Off the script, online store, barbershopwindow.com. Go to the homepage and type in off the script in the search bar. You'll take, you know, a couple of seconds. You'll see my own online shop there. $19.99. They got every t-shirt from the show. Get off my TV, the Goon City t-shirt, the original gray off the script logo. $19.99. No matter where you are, they ship worldwide, man. So make sure you guys go get your t-shirts today. And speaking of t-shirts... Go pick up a Legionary t-shirt as well, man. My brother's link to his website is linked down below as well. WrestleRumble.com, man. WrestleRumble.com is giving away $500 cash. And now, now, not lower level tickets, man. They're giving you guys a luxury fucking suite to the Royal Rumble, man. Two tickets to the 2017 Royal Rumble in the Alamo Dome. Luxury box seats. WrestleRumble.com. You buy in. You buy an entry. You answer the questions that they're going to email you. And you're going to win some fucking money, man. Use your knowledge. Put your knowledge to the test. Answer the, co the correct questions or answer the questions correctly with whatever they ask you. You know, who wins the match? Who's going to win between Sasha and Charlotte? Who's going to win between Rusev and, and Roman Reigns? Uh, you know, how long is the match going to go? Is the match going to go over 20 minutes or not? They're going to ask you a bunch of shit, man. It's not going to be easy. But if you guys have any knowledge of the product, I'm fucking schooling you guys the best that I can. You should be an easy win, man. Win yourself some fucking tickets to the Royal Rumble. If I don't win it, because I'm going to be in it, I want someone who listens to Off The Script to win it, man. 2017 Royal Rumble luxury box suite tickets and $500 cash. WrestleRumble.com and on Twitter, at Hell in a Cell. Pick them. So make sure you guys go follow them and tweet along with them during Hell in a Cell. Also, guys... WrestleCrate, WrestleCrate.com, and on Twitter at WrestleCrate, use the coupon code JD sent me for instant 10% off. And WWE Slam Crate, man. I got my tracking number. It's coming. It's on the way. Hopefully, an unboxing next week on Off the Script. If you guys want to check out the WWE Slam Crate, down below is the link I provide to go to the website and use the coupon code JD from NY for an instant 10% off WWE Slam Crate, man. Go check that shit out as well. And, as always, follow me on Twitter at JD from NY206 and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Thank you guys so much. Thank you to everybody that's come over from Grimm's Toy Show. If you made it this far, I don't know. 
But thank you guys for everything. I will see you all on part three for Off the Script. Until then, I'm JD. Hit that thumbs up, and I'll see you guys on Sunday morning.